change to a view presentation or something like that. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't get Rocio. Can you see my PowerPoint or not? Yes, yes, I can see it. Yeah, I can see. I can see. And now, now it's perfect. Now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, in the in the last class, we talked about ap applying topological data analysis to graphs, specifically to blockchain graphs, to Ethereum token networks, and to the Bitcoin graph. Today, I'm going to share you an article that we published at uh, NURIX 2022 about applying persistent homology to any type of graph, the graphs that we typically use in graph neural networks. These are uh, biological data sets, molecular data sets, and these are graph classification data sets. I will go into detail, but this is the first time I'm showing you an application of TDA on ordinary graphs, let's say social networks and so on. Uh, today, I have two things. First, I will show you this, this application, and then I will, I will talk about a topological approach that we had uh, for, for the Bitcoin address embeddings. So in that work, we don't use persistent homology. However, we look at the topology of the network. That is interesting because even if you don't use persistent homology, let's say, you can still use ideas from topological data analysis in your own work. For example, we talked about higher order graphs. What this means is that instead of nodes and edges, now we have nodes, edges, and then we have other structures that look like nodes, for example, two simplexes, three simplexes, and so on. So these are higher order uh, studies of graphs. Then we also have a filtration. The idea of filtration is also interesting. So you define a distance threshold and then based on this distance threshold, you're, you change the threshold and more and more of the graph appears. So these are interesting ideas from topology that you can use in other uh, fields. It doesn't have to be persistent homology. You don't have to look at uh, k-dimensional holes. You can look at other things. For example, you can do ordinary graph analysis. You can do motive counting and so on. So that is important. Now, here is the paper that I will present in the first part. Uh, and the main idea of this paper is this. Persistent homology is very costly. Can we find a way to apply persistent homology on very large graphs? So. This is a continuation, actually, because uh, this is a figure from a slide that I showed on Wednesday. And here in the figure, you are seeing an Ethereum token network for just one day. So when we were working on applying persistent homology to these Ethereum token networks, what I realized is that in this case, most of the network is so sparse. There is no community structure. We could basically eliminate some of the edges and nodes, and we will still have the same uh, persistent homology summaries. For example, consider this edge here that connects, let's say, A and B. Okay. If I am looking at two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and so on holes in the system, in this graph, remember what was a two-dimensional hole? A two-dimensional hole was basically a loop in the graph. So, for example, if you have uh, vertices like this, if there is a hole in them, this is a one dimensional hole. If you think about it, this edge between A and B, these nodes here. So this edge is never going to contribute to a one dimensional hole, right? This is kind of a bridge edge. If you just delete this edge, it does not change anything. Similarly, consider this edge between, for example, C and D, okay? If you are looking at one dimensional loops, you can just delete this node here because this node is never going to be a part of a two dimensional hole or three dimensional hole or anything. So this, this node will never participate in a loop because it has just degree one. So if it had other neighbors like this, then there could be a loop here. But in this case, there is just one. Edge. So if we delete this, what we do is we get the same persistent homology results, but much faster. So the idea came from this work. Now, 
what is the complexity of persistent homology? Persistent homology is a, is a good thing, but it is prohibitively computationally costly. So for this reason, most of the personal homology studies are limited to small graphs with a few thousand vertices at most. And what is the complexity? The complexity of personal homology is the number of simplices cubed. So this n here is the number of simplices and the simplices can be, for example, zero simplices, one simplices, two simplices. So what this means is that if you are looking, for example, k equal to two dimensional holes, this is costlier than looking at one dimensional holes. So if you increase the person homology dimension, the costs become higher and higher. For this reason, most of the time we look at zero, one and two dimensional holes in graphs, because if you go to three and four, it is too costly. And most of the time, these holes don't exist anyway. So even if you search, you don't find anything. In theory, this k could go very large. For example, you can make it 100 or something. But we don't go because doing this creates too many simplices. Because remember, in the simplices, for example, if you have nodes like this, for example, they are creating a triangle and so on. So with more, with a bigger threshold, you get more and more simplices because the graph gets more and more connected. So more edges appear, more triangles appear, and so on. So the costs become prohibitively high. For this reason, computation is limited to small graphs. And I say small, but actually, if you think about it, I will show you the data sets. These are the data sets that graph neural networks use. So we are not using smaller data sets than graph neural networks. But the graph neural networks also work on very small graphs. If you look at, for example, graph classification data sets, I think the biggest data set that people commonly use has around 500 vertices, 5,000 vertices. So this is small. In computer science, usually I, I come from the graph mining era of 2010s. We were working with, for example, 100,000 vertex graphs and the reviewers were saying that they are too small. So 5,000 is almost nothing, right? So our approach is that we introduce two new algorithms, which reduce the cost of computing persistence diagrams for large real world networks. The first one is Coral TDA and the second one is Prunit. Now, to refresh our memory, let me discuss filtration again. Persistence homology in a network setting requires using a power filtration or using different complexes. For example, this Viatoris ribs, Czech complexes, we use them to construct a filtration for a given filtering function. So, Instead, we focus on the sub and super level filtration. Why? Because sub and super level filtration are actually faster than Vietor strips. Because in Vietor strips, uh, any, no any two nodes can be connected if the distance, the shortest path distance, is less than the threshold, right? In sub super level filtration, we only work on the node activations. So the network does not get too connected even if you increase the filtration. For this reason, with sub and super level filtration, I was actually successful to run personal homology on 20,000 vertex graphs. Okay. So another important uh, thing about sub super level filtration is that we can inject domain information into the process. Remember we had nodes and then we had node activation values and these node activation values could come from the domain. For example, if they are uh, elements, we could use their atomic weights. This is very important to bring in the domain information. Our results can be generalized to the person homology defined with a filtering function for different complexes. So I will show you that Coral TDA can work with any kind of uh, filtering function, any kind of complex, for example. Now, Coral TDA uses this idea that I'm showing with the figure on the right. If you take this graph or the network, there are 10 vertices. This first vertex here is not connected to the, to the graph. So let's say it is disconnected. But all the others create a single connected component. And on this connected component, when you look at this loop here between 4, 9, 8, and 6, this one here, it appears on the second core and the third core vertices. So the idea is that the vertex tree, 
vertex 5 and vertex 7 cannot create a one dimensional hole because they just have one degree. So they are not connected to any other node this way to create a hole here. By definition, these one degree uh, vertices do not contribute to two dimensional holes, three dimensional holes, nothing. So the idea is this. If we have this inside, we can use something called a core decomposition, specifically k-core decomposition. This is a very simple algorithm. This says that start with a graph, delete all the vertices that have less than degree, for example, one. If you delete degree one, some of the vertices may lose ver uh, neighbors and then in turn, they may become degree one. You delete them iteratively. So you delete iteratively until nothing is left with degree one. For example, if another node here connected to seven, let's say that is 12, in the first iteration, I would delete 12 because 12 has degree one, but I wouldn't delete seven because seven has degree two. Then in the next iteration, I see that seven now has degree one, so I would delete seven and then so on, but I cannot delete six because it says, even if I delete seven and 12, six will still have two, two neighbors. This is the idea of code decomposition. It gives a nice hierarchical ordering of your graph. And this hierarchy can be used to filter out edges don't, that do not change the topology. In general, we say that the K plus one core of a graph is enough to compute the Kate persistence diagram of the graph. So what this is saying is that if you are given a graph G, and if you are looking for K dimensional holes in it, you can take the graph, you can find the core of K plus one and higher, and then that is enough to give you the exact same persistence diagram. Okay, so what this is saying is that in this graph, for example, if I removed three, five and seven and one, I will still get the same hole. I will not lose any information. This is the main insight of Coral TDA. And it is quite useful because it can reduce the graph size a lot. We can delete all these unnecessary vertices to find one loops. And then we can delete the two core to find, for example, two dimensional holes. And then we can delete the three core and below to find, for example, three dimensional holes and so on. This is quite useful. Now, the second idea is called prune it. In prune it, we use something called domination. In algebraic topology, there is a concept called homophily that is a very effective tool, homotopy, sorry, is a very effective tool to compute topological invariance like homology. If two spaces are homotopy equivalent, then their topological invariants are the same. By here, the invariance, we mean that they will have the same persistence diagram. Okay, so for to be able to do this, we first need to find which vertices dominate which other vertices. Uh, for this reason, we first define the neighborhood of a vertex as the neighbors of that node plus the node itself. So here are the neighbors, and this is the vertex U0, for example, we get the neighborhood. Then if the neighborhood of U0 is a subset of the vertex set, that is all vertices adjacent to U0 and U0 itself. That's, I think, a clear idea. For example, here, if you are looking at the neighborhood set of vertex 6, this vertex here, we will find that it is 4, 5, plus 6 itself. So this is the neighborhood of vertex 6, for example. Then we say that a vertex U is dominated by another vertex V if the neighborhood of U is a subset of neighborhood of V. Okay? If there is such a vertex V, then we call U a dominated vertex of G. For example, if you look at here, vertex 3, what is the neighborhood of vertex 3? It is 1, 2, 4, 5, and plus 3 itself. What is the neighborhood of 1? It is 2, 3, 4, and 1 itself. And what is the neighborhood of uh, 2? It is 1, 3, 5, and the node itself 2. So if you, if you look at this, the neighborhood of 1 
is a subset of neighborhood of three. In this sense, we say that three dominates one. If three dominates one, then we can delete one from the graph. If three dominates two, then we can delete two from the graph. Then instead of using this whole graph in the computation of persistent homology, we can just use it the reduce, we can just use the reduced graph. This is the main idea. So in this example here, the filtration function is important. In coral TDA, we can use the sub-level filtration, we can use the super-level filtration, everything works, viatory strips and so on. In prunit, we need to use the super-level filtration. So we need to come, super-level filtration, uh, but I'm saying super-level, but we can find node activation values that also works with sub-level filtration. Okay. So the only thing that we need to know is the dominated vertex should appear the filtration later than the dominating vertex. So if you can find the node activation function where three appears before one and two, then you say that three dominates one and two. In another, for example, sublevel, if you find that three appears still before one and two, then three dominates one and two again. So it super level or sub level is not important. You just need to find the function. You cannot, for example, use these. Uh, here we are using, for example, the neighbors and the degree, right? You cannot use this prunit idea with the sublevel filtration. Because if you do sublevel filtration, one and two will appear before three because they have less degree, less neighbors. This is an important distinction. Now, we experimented with every kind of data set basically we could find uh, molecular, chemi chemical, biological networks, single graph, citation networks, social graphs, co authorship graphs, Facebook, Twitter, ego networks, and then the open GD data sets. Uh, remember, we are doing, we are looking at graph classification. So in each data set, we have graph classification. That means we have multiple graphs and they have their labels. That means every data set, for example, archive, let's say has, I don't know, I don't remember the number, have 10,000 graphs. So what we do is for each graph from one to N, we give them to the coral TDA, for example, and we get a reduced graph. And then we do persistent homology on this reduced graph. And the idea is to reduce the cost between these two. So if G1, for example, have has 1,000 vertices, G1, uh, G1 prime, let's say, should have less, maybe 100. If this is the case, then we win. The computation costs are reduced. And the idea is to see if our algorithms that are nice in theory can be applied to real world graphs. Because in real world graphs, maybe nothing is dominating uh, by any other, nothing, no vertexes are uh, dominating others. So maybe our methods are nice in theory, but not working in practice. If you look at our evaluation here, I am showing you four figures. For different data sets, it's the same figure. On the x-axis, we have the topological dimension. On the y-axis, we have the vertex reduction. Vertex reduction means how much percent of the vertices we can remove from the graph by using, for example, coral TDA. This is, these are the results for coral TDA. Higher values are good. For example, if we are reducing 100%, that means we are deleting all of the vertices. That means we can actually save a lot of time because in these graphs, for example, consider this dimension four. Look at how every graph is reduced by 100%. These are proteins, Reddit B, seen and seen new graphs. 100% reduced means that if you run, for example, the pH algorithm on these graphs, you would find exactly nothing. So your persistence diagram would be empty. That means there are no four dimensional holes in these graphs. But in order to find this, you would have to compute the rank of a homology group, all these matrix operations, you would spend a lot of time and then you would find nothing. With this reduction, we can kind of say, here are the values and don't even try to run persistent homology because there is nothing in that. And the, the good thing is that core decomposition is a very fast algorithm compared to the ON cube uh, complexity of persistent homology, 
the core decomposition algorithm is very fast. So it, it, I also have the time experiments, but I will not show them here. It takes a few seconds, even on the largest data set to find the core decomposition and apply the, for example, core OTDA. So Facebook and Twitter data sets are reduced by 10% for K bigger than four. For all the other data sets for dimensions four or higher, we basically have empty sets. That means there are no four dimensional, five dimensional holes in these data sets. There is no need uh, looking for them. The second result is from Prunit. Here I am showing you the vertex reduction again. That means how much percent of the vertices we are able to delete. On the left, I am showing you Reddit and all these data sets. On the right, I am showing you two data sets that are big from the OGB uh, benchmark. OGB benchmark is from Stanford. They have these graphs that are becoming like the main data sets where people try their graph machine learning algorithms. Uh, on the left, we have the averages over graphs. For example, in Reddit B, I think there are 5,000 graphs. And if you look at it, uh, we can reduce almost 80% of the vertices. Okay. Uh, first MM and CNU are reduced by less than 10%. However, all the other data sets are reduced by at least 35% if we use Prunit on them. On the right data set, I am showing you each data set with each graph specifically. So here, each dot is a graph. For example, this graph here is has around, let's say, 1,200 vertices, and we can remove almost 70% of the vertices. So only 30%, uh, which means we are left with around 360 vertices in the reduced form, which is actually quite good. You see, even on these large yeah. graphs, we have such high reduction. Excuse me. High I, yeah, there is a question from Sarah. Uh, is there any information lose after the reduction? Information, uh, can you see the chat? The question is there, yeah, the chat. Sure. Well, I think well, she needs yeah. the information how how much is lost. Yeah. Yes, yes, I understand. So there is no information loss with any of these methods. That's the good thing. So this paper was in Europe spotlight. So it was selected as one of the top papers to be presented. So we don't lose any information. It, it is exactly equal. So instead of, for example, you take the persistent homology of a graph, or you take the persistent homology of a graph, after, for example, the reduction on the graph, they are the same. That, that is the good thing. So we don't lose any information. In NeurIPS, actually, there was another paper that was using neural networks to estimate uh, persistent homology diagrams, persistence diagrams. It was, it was like a sampling from the graph, so you retain the structure so that you have similar values. But in our case, we actually give equivalent results. Yeah, good question. So further evaluation of the methods. Here, uh, reviewers ask for these large graphs. So what can you do with very large graphs? If you look at here, on this very large graph, for example, we can renew, remove 59% of the uh, vertices if we use both coral TV and prune it at the same time. Yeah. So uh, edges are removed, 25 of them. So if you look at it, for example, 60% of the vertices are removed, but only 25% of the edges. This is because when you have graphs like this, there are, there are many vertices that are low degree. We can basically remove all of them, but we will not remove too many edges, for example, because the edges are dominated by other highly connected uh, vertices. Okay. So the results are good. On the right, I am showing you the vertex reduction results for 11 data sets after we apply Prunit and Coral TV algorithms at the same time. You see that around, for example, four or five here, most of the graphs are almost reduced by 100%. So, so that means there are no five, six, seven dimensional holes in most of these graphs. So this, uh, in this box plot, for example, this is the box plot. Here is showing the mean, the mean value. 
If the mean value is high, that's also good. In this case, for example, you see the mean value is around 100%. So that means apart from a few graphs, most of the graphs are completely reduced. So we find something interesting. Uh, we found that there is a relationship between the clustering coefficient of the graph and the Betty values. Let me remind you what is the clustering coefficient. If you have a graph, clustering coefficient is basically the number of triangles, triangles existing over the number of triangles that are possible. Possible. So that means that if, if the clustering coefficient is high, then many nodes are connected with each other. There are many triangles. Okay. So if the clustering coefficient, let's say coefficient is high, that means the uh, triangles are closed. Triangles are closed. Yeah. So what we found is that by just looking at the clustering coefficient, you can kind of see if there will be any holes in your data. That's also useful because then, for example, if the clustering coefficient is high like this, then you say, okay, I mean, if even if you run person homology, you will not find anything. Okay, so there is no need in using uh, person homology in graphs that are completely connected. Especially, let's say you are looking at Betty one, Betty two, then there is no need for this because you will not have loops. Everything will become triangle synthesis and so. There is a seminal result from Kahle, a famous mathematician, that says in order to observe non-trivial Betty numbers for higher dimensions in erdos schrenyi graphs, the average degree must be very high. For example, if you are looking at a graph with parameters n and p, and n here is the number of nodes in the graph, and p is the probability of an edge forming between two nodes. erdos schrenyi is a synthetic graph family. In order to have, for example, non-trivial k-tomology, Kale proved that for p is equal to n to the power of alpha, alpha should be between one minus minus one over k and one minus one over k plus one. In simple terms, that means that for dimension k2, the average degree in the graph should be between square root of n and this value. Even more simply, it says if you have a graph of thousand vertices, then the average degree should be between 31 and 100. So this says, if you want to have these high dimensional holes, your graph should be connected, well connected. However, when you look at our results, we show that higher Betty numbers are prevalent even in sparse graphs. So that is something interesting. In some graphs, we have very high Betty numbers. And before us, actually, we could not compute them because it was too costly. Now we can compute them with Coral TD and Prune. So this is our contribution to scaling uh, TDA to very large graphs. And I hope that this line of research will continue because uh, reduction algorithms is a thing. Uh, if you look at, for example, the survey by Hazal, there is a section, the survey paper is from 2018. Uh, they talk about reduction methods and Coral TDA and Prunit are very good reduction methods. Uh, excuse there me, uh, you need, could you put the reference in the chat or something to, to look at for the reference actually, that you just mentioned? Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, actually, Rocio, what we will do is we are going to present, prepare a markdown for these slides. Uh, we will also put the R and Python code for students to run on graphs. And I will share that uh, work okay. with you, let's say, in, in two weeks or something. But for okay. now, uh, uh, then, uh, okay, the other people can send me a, an email to my address is in the chat. So if you want to, the, the material that you need is going to share with me. Okay. Okay. Thank yes. you. Uh, but let me, let me find the survey from Hazal now because it may be useful. It's from 2018. Yeah, I'm looking for it. When you search for something, it's difficult to find it. Yep. Okay. 
I will send it to you. Sorry, I cannot find it right now on Hazal School. Yeah, yeah, don't thing. worry, don't worry. <laughs> it's because I'm okay. very interested in this. And, and um, I take uh, advantage, and, and there is a question uh, from Nabil. Uh, why is, is alpha between minus 1 divided by k and minus 1 divided by k plus 1? I think you need, <laughs> this is a question for Kahle. I will give you the reference. You can read the original paper. He proves that this, these are the two bounds. OK. <laughs> I, I will share with you. No worries. Yeah, I will share with you. Uh, good. What else? Yeah. I will continue. Uh, there is also Nabil's question that you emailed to me about application of TDA to uh, large graphs. I think, Nabil, if you can email me your question in detail, I can give you a better answer. Yeah, you okay. can find my email address if you search my name online. It's very easy on my website. So next and the last part of this lecture is uh, the topological embeddings of graphs. So here I will show you something that, that is inspired by topology, but we don't really use person topology or anything. But we look at the shape of the graphs. Uh, this is still un under submission. So I, I before before this presentation on Wednesday, I showed you a bit of how Bitcoin transactions look like. I will show you again for, for a refresher. In traditional banking, a transaction involves two parties. So for example, if Alice wants to send money to John, we can, in, we can create a graph out of this. It is directed, it is weighted, but there will be just two nodes. And the nodes are the same type, addresses of the, of the users or the bank accounts. Now, Bitcoin has a different view. In Bitcoin, you can actually create a transaction to send money to two different people. Or two different people come, can come together to create a transaction to send money to, for example, Tom. Or two people can come together and send money to two different people. So in summary, a Bitcoin transaction can have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Here, for example, in the leftmost, Alice is an input, John and Tom are outputs. Here, Alice and John are input, and Dirk and Ed are outputs. So this is a complete transaction that is created at once. So you don't create this edge that is edge let's say one, and then you create edge two. No, this transaction is created and then sent to the blockchain network at once. It's just one decision that you cannot divide. Now, this design choice is from Satoshi Nakamoto. Okay, and it complicates things because if you think about it, now you have a transaction and you have addresses, input and output addresses, but you don't know if Alice is sending money to Dirk or if Alice is sending money to Ed and John is sending money to Dirk. Or they could each send 0 0.5 Bitcoins to Dirk, for example, and 0 0.5 Bitcoins to Ed. So we cannot know what is happening inside the transaction. Okay. In this case, then, it brings the question, who is sending coins to Dirk? It is Alice or John. It can be both Alice and John, or it can be Alice, or it can be John. Next. Let's say Tom received money in the previous transaction, then Tom needs to spend this money. Tom needs to say which transaction gave him these two Bitcoins, for example. This is called the proof of funds. So in the future, if Bob wants to send a transaction, it needs to create a new transaction that says, my money is coming from transaction two. So if we see each transaction separately, but we can put transactions together to create this graph. In a sense, starting from transaction three, you can find that the money came from transaction two and transaction two received money from transaction one and so on. So you can see the whole network public. In banking, we cannot see this information, right? So this is the Bitcoin transaction network. Here, instead of addresses, I am showing names. It doesn't matter. And the transactions are flowing from the left to the right. And we call this a heterogeneous graph because if you consider this, there are address nodes that are circle and there are transaction nodes that are rectangles. So this is a heterogeneous graph. And in computer science, we are actually not good with heterogeneous graphs. I think I wrote it wrong, but in computer science, we usually have graphs with just one node type. Okay. Now, 
I mentioned this before, instead of using nodes and edges, we say we are going to consider the whole transaction as a building block of the graph. For example, here is the first building block. Here is the second building block, block two. Here is the third building block, block three. And then here we have the fourth building block. And we call each building block a one chain net. And why do we say one chain net? It's because uh, there is just one transaction in each one of them. So here is, for example, transaction one and chain net B1. And if you think about it, transaction one, for example, has three inputs and three outputs. So if you want to give a shape to T1, we say that it is three to three, but I will come to this in a second. So we published this paper in 2018. This was our first paper on blockchains. We were trying to do Bitcoin price prediction. And it has become quite a successful paper because if you think about it, we define a data structure for blockchain graphs, for Bitcoin graphs. Now, uh, I also showed this, but refreshing is good. So transaction one has type three to three, transaction two has type two to three, transaction three has type two to two, and transaction four again has type two to two. If you think about it, transaction three and transaction four have the same shapes. And we believe that shapes are important because why we believe in this? Uh, if there is a transaction that is just sending money to one other address, that means this is basically a selling transaction. If you have a transaction with thousands of input addresses and just one output address, that means someone is buying Bitcoins from many other people in the same transaction. So this is an investment transaction. So shapes are important. They can tell us this, this uh, the reason behind the transaction. Yeah. For a given time granularity, for example, 24 hours, we can take snapshots of the Bitcoin graph and we can store chain net counts in an N by N matrix. So what happens here is that we, for example, take transaction one. Transaction one has input three, output three. And input three is here, the output three is here. So transaction one goes into this set. Transaction two has two inputs and three outputs. It is two inputs and three outputs again. So the transaction two is recorded here. And transaction three and four are recorded in the two and two cell. So if we count them, we will find that, for example, the matrix has value two for input two and output two. This set. For all the other set cells, we need to insert zero. That is one disadvantage. So here I am showing the percentages of all Bitcoin chain nets on the Bitcoin transaction network. And I am showing the matrix just for six by six. If you look at this value that says 57% of all Bitcoin transactions have one input and two outputs. That is because that means uh, these are, this is the most common ordinary transaction. These transactions here, for example, they, they have many inputs and many outputs. So they are more likely to be, for example, uh, transfer transactions and so on. So this matrix is important. Yeah. One interesting thing that we found is that if you look at Bitcoin, we computed this matrix for Bitcoin and then we computed it for another blockchain, Litecoin. And we found the same values with only differences in the third decimal spaces. So it was like 57.04 for the Litecoin as well. So that means blockchains are actually ruled by similar dynamics. I find it fascinating that two different blockchains with completely different people have the same behavior over time. Yeah. We use chain nets in price prediction, volatility and risk analysis, address type classification, but Recently, we found a more interesting use. Now, consider this toy transaction network. There are two transactions. This actually is how a ransomware payment works on the Bitcoin blockchain. A ransomware is a kind of malware that locks your computer and asks for Bitcoins to release your data. And hackers can basically infect your computer and demand ransom. And here is what happens. Ran ransomware tells you an address, A0, as we show a black address here, that is the hacker's address, and says, send me two Bitcoins at address A0, okay? 
And then the victims create a transaction T1 where they buy Bitcoins from an exchange. And because this amount is usually big, two Bitcoins, the exchange takes small amounts, for example, 0 0.2 0 .2 Bitcoin, 0 0.2 Bitcoin, and so on, 0 0.1 Bitcoin, and uses multiple input addresses in that transaction T1. And then the output is just one address. This money here now belongs to the victim at address A1. Then after some time, A1 creates a transaction to send money to the hacker's address. And if, for example, it bought, it bought 2.5 Bitcoins and the uh, hacker must be paid 0 0.5 Bitcoin or something, then the rest of the money is sent to a new address. That is the change, change amount, rest of the money. So if you just look at this transaction pattern, what we found is that, yeah, what we found is that you actually catch many true positives. Here, the red line is the number of true positives and the blue is not blue, but green, let's say, uh, is, sorry, red is false positive and the true is the uh, true positive. So this approach catches a lot of true positives. Look at this here. In this day, we find 100 ransomware payments. And how do we find them? We actually have data coming from past ransomware transactions that are reported to the police. So we have a set of Bitcoin addresses that we know belong to the ransomware hackers. So we use our approach in a backtesting manner and we try to predict these known addresses. And this data comes from this. So we, there are a lot of true positives, but there are also many false positives. So first of all, the ransomware hackers, they cannot just receive Bitcoins and go to an exchange to sell them for dollars, for example, because the police will catch them. What they need to do is ransomware operators or people who sell goods on dark net markets must create these transactions to sell their dark coins. But they need to be smart. They cannot just go and sell after the transaction. They need to create fake transactions to blend in the network. And there are three strategies that are used since 2009 to create these fake transactions. In the first scheme that is used between 2009 and 2013, hackers create hiding patterns. So for example, they create transactions that are looped and all the way. And the goal is that if you create too many transactions like this, maybe the police will not be able to trace them in time. In the beginning, maybe it was true, but no longer. Then people started using coin mixing. That is another thing that I will not go into detail. That's a very effective strategy. And since 2018, people are using chain hopping. That means they sell the Bitcoins for a privacy coin. And in the privacy coin, they make some transactions to hide their tracks. And then let's say these are the transactions in the privacy coin. And then they come back to Bitcoin and the money is laundered in this process. This is called chain hopping. Now, <clears throat> how can we use chain nets to detect these ransomware payments or darknet transactions? What we can do is we can look at two chain nets. So one chain nets we said have distinct shapes. What about two chain nets? In two chain nets, remember we have two transactions. Let's look at transaction one and transaction two. Let's look at transaction two and transaction four. Let's look at transaction three and transaction four. Now. If you look at the position of address A and address B, they appear in multiple positions in multiple two chain nets. We can actually encode the positions. So we can say, for example, if you are the third input of transaction one, that is not input to transaction two, you have a specific position in the network. So that is the topological information that we are using. The address A appears in the middle, but it does not contribute to the second transaction. So we can give it a specific position. We use orbits for this row. Let's say we have a graph where we can define two chain nets and we have an address node in CK. We define the orbit with respect to the chain net as the collection of the images where an image is, is an isomorphism from the chain net to another K chain. I will not bore you with details, but what this is saying is that starting from very small transactions and chain nets, we can 
increase, we can give, we can define specific roles and then we can give them IDs. For example, here, this red address has orbit ID three. Here, this gray address has orbit ID four. So in the future, if we have another transaction, another two chain net with the same structure, the address here, for example, let's say this is address A, this is address B, this is address C, this is address D. Address A has orbit three in the first K chain net. Address three will have orbit three again. Why? Because it's the same two chain net. Address D will have orbit four again. And we count these orbits from zero with the smallest transaction shape to 47, the largest transaction shape. In general, we have 48 unique positions in the network. That means 48 unique orbits. And here, you will notice that, for example, two red addresses, this address, let's say, D or E and F, they both are red in the same position. Topologically, they are the same address. So both of them get orbit 33, both of them. Here, these addresses have the same role. Both of them get 36. What is the difference between 33 and 36? Well, in the 33, the second transaction has just one output. In this chain net, transaction two has two outputs. So these two shapes are not the same. Any questions from here? Uh, yes, uh, there is a question from Socrates. Can you read it? So let me check. Yeah. Uh, after the taproot actualization in Bitcoin, is that the same topological information to where transactions are made? Yes. So the taproot activation is actually hiding if there are multiple inputs uh, to a transaction. However, Socrat, the taproot uh, utilization is very, very low. So the Bitcoin people activated, implemented Taproot in 2019 or something like this, and they people are just not using it. It's, if, if they use it, yes, but they, they are not using it. So uh, we could not work with Taproot data, uh, Taproot addresses, let's say, but people are not using them that much. So it's not a concern. The, the the utilization rate is so low that Bitcoin people think it was just a waste of efforts to implement Taproot. Anyways, back, back to the orbits. The orbits are actually quite useful. If you think about it, now we can say today is, for example, uh, May 26. Give me all the addresses that appear in similar orbits to an address that I'm interested in. So you can do similarity queries. You can do behavior search queries. You can say, for example, Give me addresses that appear in rows 33 or 36, because 30, rows 33 and 36 are similar to each other. The only difference is that in the 33 case, the transaction two has just one output. In the 36, there are two outputs. So if you think about it, 33 is similar to 36, 34 is similar to 37, and they are not similar to, for example, three or four. So we can do similarity queries as well. We can search for specific patterns, for example, if we are looking for coin mixing transactions, we can look at orbits 30 to 47 and so on. Then if you take these orbits as address embeddings, you can do supervised learning. You can do address type classification. You can use these orbit IDs as node features in graph neural networks. You can visualize the graph in terms of orbit summaries. So. We are still looking for novel ways. Actually, I am pitching these, uh, this orbit idea to blockchain analytics companies like uh, Coinbase and TRM Labs, and we will see if, uh, if a company adopts them. I will be very happy to work with you if you, are, if you have a company and if you want to implement it. Now, let me give you a few examples. I think I will be done in like three, four slides. Uh, let me give you an example where orbits can be useful. Okay, If you look at... For example, darknet market transactions, these are DM, and ransomware transactions that are RS. So if you look at ransomware transactions, you will see that this pattern here, the pattern that says orbit nine is one, orbit three is one, and orbit four is one. One means this address appeared in orbit 14 one time. Zero means it did not appear in that orbit. 
And typically, an address is only connected to a single occurrence. So when we look at the values, most of them are one. So you, it can be, for example, one to, let's say, thousands, but usually we see zero or ones. On average, white addresses have three distinct non-zero orbits. That means they appear in three different orbits. And darknet market addresses have six non-zero orbits. What that means is that darknet market addresses are connected in many two chain nets. Ransomware addresses also have non six non-zero orbits. That is surprising because you will, if the hackers are smart, they give one address to each victim. But hackers in the beginning especially were not that smart. So they were giving the same ransom address to multiple victims. In that way, we could link ransomware transactions to each other. Uh, 6.7 here, this percentage means that 6.7% of all ransomware addresses have this specific pattern. Yeah, and this specific pattern is shown with these three two chainlets. So each one, this one is, for example, a one two chainlet. This one is another two chainlet. And sorry, this one, another two chainlet. And this one is another two chainlet. So typical ransomware address looks like this. It receives money from two, three addresses, and then spends them in just one output. You see, it spends them in transaction form. That is useful. Now you can go and search the network for this specific behavior. So an identical orbit search actually reveals an interesting result. Here, instead of zero, one, or values, I am showing tick marks. Tick marks means, for example, the address has orbit eight. It can be one or it can be thousand. We don't care. It is bigger than zero. The missing values, the blank values, means zero. So these, for example, would be zero. And the interesting result is that in 95.9% .9 of the addresses with the first pattern, we identify them as ransomware addresses. There is this white address here that we believe is also, a, for example, ransomware address that is not known by anybody. So you can do this type of analysis. For example, here, you find 81 of them are ransomware addresses or darknet market addresses, and then this white addresses, 21 of them, now are automatically very suspicious. If you, are a, if you are the police, maybe you go look at these 21 addresses specifically because they co-appear with darknet market and ransomware addresses. Okay. Yeah. So furthermore, I showed you like descriptive statistics. Furthermore, we actually uh, use these address orbits in a supervised learning setting for address type classification. In this problem, we are given the Bitcoin transaction network. We have some past data, some past labels, but they are very missing. They are very few. And the network contains around 600,000 addresses per day over 10 years. 600,000 addresses over 10 years. So a lot of data. This is why graph neural networks are not really used in these settings, because they cannot handle such big things. But orbits can do, because with orbits, we can process an entire day's data in 10 minutes. OK, so we take orbits of white addresses, darknet market addresses, ransomware addresses, and then we do classification with these three label types. And we track the AUC score for each class with a one versus rest random forest classifier. And the training test split is 80 to 20. And here I am showing you the uh, ROC curve uh, the AUC for the ROC curve for white address, ransomware addresses, and darknet addresses. As you can see, the performance is quite well. On the left figure, I am showing you the case with 500,000 white addresses. On the right, with 1 million, because white addresses is, is so many. If we just include everything, it will destroy the classifier. So we are undersampling the minority class. Here we have 500k white addresses. Here we have 1 million white addresses. But this is actually quite new because I have never seen so many addresses uh, in an address classification article. So we are also new in that. What we learned from our uh, studies is that e-crime is surprisingly easy to detect, but the process creates too many false positives. So e-crime operators are now sophisticated. They make transactions to look like ordinary transactions. Blockchains are becoming quite adversarial. By adversarial, I mean that illicit operators like the ransomware hackers create these fake transactions in smarter ways. And if there is too much volume in illicit coins and transactions, their task is difficult because they need to create too many fake transactions without getting caught. 
In this case, for example, in the ransomware behavior, they need to control the victim's behavior. Because remember, I showed you this figure and I said that the exchange is creating transaction one and putting all the Bitcoins into the victim's address at A1. And then the A1 is creating the second transaction to pay the ransomware attack. And this pattern is so specific that we can just go and search for this pattern and find many suspicious addresses. In the future, hackers will tell victims to, for example, create a very specific type. For example, it can tell the victim to create a transaction that has just one input and two outputs. And one of them should be the ransomware address. If they follow these strategies now, it will become very difficult to catch because we will no longer be able to use these specific patterns. Yeah. And all this data that I talked about in this three-day course can be found on chartalist.org. We presented this one as well on New Rips 2022 in the datasets and benchmarks track. We have uh, Python loaders. I also have a Udemy course where I teach data science on blockchains. Our course now was about topological data analysis, but I also teach how blockchains work from scratch. Thank you very much for attending. If you have questions, please email me. We will share uh, a, a markdown file for this course. Markdown, and we will also share tutorials in R and Python for this course. So uh, mm -hmm. please check my uh, web page. In let's say two three weeks, we should have something there. Okay, thank and you thank very you much. <laughs> so, do you have any question? For me, it has been quite surprising. For me, it has been quite surprising that um, in the big uh, data, uh, like uh, YouTube or the big the big graphs, there is not many high dimensional holes. So, when in case greater than four, there is no hole. This is very surprising because I I thought that it it was more complicated, the topology. There. Yes, uh, we actually found holes almost only in Facebook and Twitter ego networks for these high dimensions. Mm -hmm. So in social yeah. networks, when people uh, in social networks, when people do not become friends because they hate each other, so they mm -hmm. create high, high dimensional holes. Uh -huh. Only in social networks, we solve this behavior. Uh -huh. And in the Ethery Rich filtration, when you have a, a point cloud, uh, did you try did you try to compute in a very large point cloud persistent homology? And did you try your your method? Is and this work or uh, we we did not in the point cloud? No, because let me tell you one thing about the point clouds. I think that is an insight that I would like to also talk about. Now, if you think about it. A point cloud is data like this, right? So you increase a threshold that is a closed ball around, around data, and then you get some intersections of closed balls. And based on these inter in intersections, you create edges between data points. So in a sense, uh, the first data point can be connected to any other data point. We don't know. In Sub-level, super-level filtration, we have a graph. And if the graph is like this, we know that, for example, there is no edge between 1 and 3. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. can use this information to actually reduce the computational costs. I have not been able to do that yet, but that is an mm -hmm. insight. Because in graph, we have edges to guide us. Yeah. In data yeah. point cloud, anything can be connected. In graph, we have mm -hmm. edges. We need to focus on edges. If there is no edge between one and three, don't try to check the distance between one and three and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Luciano has a um, question, but maybe you can you can say loud, Luciano, because I put you as presenter. Okay. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, 
Hello. Yeah, we hear you. Hello. OK, OK. Well, um, mm -hmm. I was asking myself if there are another topological information that are not persistent homology or the orbits that are also source of some information about the data. Uh, I have not talked about TDA mapper. Uh, there, is, there is a method called TDA mapper that is more scalable than persistent homology. Uh, I actually talked about it in the very beginning when I said that TDA is uh, divided into two mainly. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me find this slide. Uh, here, TDA mapper. You can look at TDA mapper to find, for example, in a recent graph neural network work, what we do is that we put the graph into TDA mapper, and TDA mapper gives us these clusters. So in this figure, each uh, vertex is a cluster itself. It's a collection of data points, not just one graph, but multiple graphs. And then we can give IDs to these clusters distinctly. And then we can use IDs as node features in the graph neural network. That was helpful. It increased the EUC a lot. So TDA mapper. If you look at my profile, uh, I have the Bitcoin Heist paper that is about TDA mapper. And I can I can give you the code as well in Python if you just email me for the TDA mapper. That can be useful. But here, even here, you need to define some node features. TDA mapper is working with node features. Okay, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice, nice. Okay, thank you. So, any other question? Yeah, if not, Rocio, thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, thank you. Thank you to you. So, we will keep in contact. Uh, yes, I, I hope you I will send me the. I always wanted to teach yes. this, but did not have the time and the courage to prepare the slides and so on. So uh, thank you again for the for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. So bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.